Life, a User's Manual, by George Perec, translated from the French by David Bellows, and published by Godine, originally published in French in 1978. Confined to our homes, an entire world memorizing the same walls, knickknacks, accoutrements, there was no better time for me to discover and devour this modern masterpiece. From the back cover, Structured around a single moment in time, 8 p.m. on June 23, 1975, in a Parisian apartment block, room by room, going through the stories of the objects and lives of the tenants, past and present. This is my story of reading Perec in the spring of 2020 at home. Part one, it begins on the stairs. Well, it seems Mr. Perec has set up a game, or rather a puzzle. He has designed a puzzle for me. But is he Bartle Booth? or Winkler. And which one does that make me? To wit, from the preamble, Roman numeral 18. From this one can make a deduction which is quite certainly the ultimate truth of jigsaw puzzles. Despite appearances, puzzling is not a solitary game. Every move the puzzler makes, the puzzle maker has made before. Every piece the puzzler picks up and picks up again and studies and strokes. Every combination he tries and tries a second time. Every blunder and every insight, each hope and each discouragement have all been designed, calculated, and decided by the other. A sample of the sort of delights that await us Rorschach, 1, Entrance Hall, page 51. The day came, alas, when the artist refused to come down from his trapeze. He had just done his last performance at the Grand Theater at Leghorn and was due to leave that evening by car for Tarbes. Despite Rorschach's and the music hall manager's pleadings, increasingly hysterical appeals from the other members of his troupe, from the musicians, the entire staff, the technicians, and from the crowds who had begun to leave, but had stopped and returned on hearing all this noise, the acrobat, in a fit of pride, cut the rope he could have come down by and began to perform at ever faster pace an uninterrupted succession of grand circles. This supreme performance lasted two hours and caused 53 spectators to pass out. The police had to be brought in. In spite of Rorschach's warnings, the policemen brought a long fire ladder and began to climb up. They didn't even get halfway. The Trise artist opened his grip and with a long scream, describing a perfect parabola, he crashed to the ground. The second part, Rorschach 2, actually. So on our behalf, for us, the ones putting together the puzzle, something about Rorschach has drawn us in. Rorschach is a producer, but he desires to be something more. He's in television, but he desires to be a creative, to be an artist. This is from his dining room, Rorschach 2, page 73. Briefly, such multifarious activities satisfied Rorschach's vanity, his taste for power, his talent for plotting and haggling. 
but they gave no nourishment to his nostalgic desire to be creative. In 15 years, he managed nonetheless to put his name to two productions, both educational series for export. What does it mean as you are trying to put the puzzle together, the puzzle that someone else has created, crafted, and cared for? What does it mean to be attracted to Rorschach in the first section, to that megalomania producer with all his vanities who desires a nostalgia for creativity? Part one ends in the boiler room with a family tree and a serious discussion about the history of this apartment building, uh, history of the ownership, how it came to be owned, how it came to be passed down. And because it's a history of ownership and with a family tree, it is also the history, briefly, of a family and the sort of recriminations and backstabbing deals who's in favor, who's out of favor, that one might expect when dealing with an inheritance. Part two. So there are three types of viewers. The first, they just accidentally clicked. And they're no longer with us. The second, have read Perek's Life, so the user manual, and are for some reason interested in what I might have to say about reading it myself. You're good, you can stay. The third are those who might be interested in one day reading life, a user's manual, but never have. And for you, I would skip these next 90 seconds. I'll start after my sip. We are in the bath very important, critical detail of this story is coming to light now in part two. We know now that Bartleby, in one of the most rolling the ball up the hill stories that you will ever hear, and then it coming back down again and rolling it up, I'm talking about syphysis, even if I cannot pronounce it. Bardo Booth spends years learning to paint watercolors. He shows no natural inclination, no talent, but he continues on. He gets just good enough from a technical standpoint. And then he spends decades going around to every single port city in the whole world with Smolf, his aide, and he paints the ports. After each port that he paints, he ships the painting back to this apartment building where Winkler creates a puzzle of each one of the ports. When Bartlebooth is done with all of the ports, he comes home and he spends the remainder of his life putting together the puzzles. Which, by the way, he does something very interesting with after he's completed. Okay, you can come back now if you left. So are we to understand that all is meaningless? That our endeavors such as Bartlebooth's, such as this apartment, writing, living, they have no lasting meaning? I think so. I think we are to understand that, but I think we are to take this as a kind of freedom. It's not a sadness. 
It's a freedom. You can do with this lack of meaning what you will. And don't cause harm to others. Don't cause harm to yourself. That's not the essence of it. It means that you can live in the details. And this work is all details, objects, lives, and the stories of them. How they got to be where they all are at the precise moment in time that is being captured. And what those objects and people at that exact moment in time are just about to do. So it's frozen. And when you look at something frozen, you can then put meaning there. But to get to there and the journey and the path and all that is, he's saying it is rolling the boulder up the hill, of course. But you can pick your boulder and you can pick your hill. I believe that's what we see. Mark Lowe, 2, chapter 30, page 152. We have a completely self-contained, fascinating murder-revenge plot. 20 pages would have made an incredible short story on its own. Twists, turns, letters back and forth between the killer and the killed, the hunted and the hunter with an explosive and fascinating ending. Winkler 2, chapter 44, page 216, an almost exact copy of the preamble from the very beginning of the book, except there are such subtle, minute differences to wit. Puzzle pieces, little chaps, there's illustrations in both sections, four of them in the preamble. Now it's down to three. The text identical. Is Parekh playing games with me? What does it mean? Is it a sign of something to come? Does it portend? Part four. What does Mr. George Perec have in store for us tonight? Come to you tonight from the study to discuss part four. I believe no action takes place in any studies in the apartment complex during part four. But it felt appropriate. It is a laborious section in the most beautiful way. The study, the office, the library is a place of intellectual labor. It's laborious, and hopefully if you surround yourself with the books, objects, accoutrements that you enjoy, those that bring you passion, then it will be a labor of love. It will be laborious, but it will be well worth it and beautiful. And this was part four. We are in the middle. The setup has occurred. 
we understand some of the threads that are going to pull us through, but we have not reached anything like a crescendo. But now we do live in that world that I believe is where Perek meant and desired to live. The world of the mundane, the everyday. It was this that I think he was most interested in, most fascinated in documenting. And when you shred yourself of the need for a beginning or the necessity of an end, you get that middle part, the part where you can languish over details, names, dates, the intricacies of a story. We're going to highlight three sections. Chapter 49, On the Stairs 7, page 247. I chuckled at this as Perek, in his desire to catalog everything within this building, actually gets at one of the true realities and nature of an apartment building, no matter which country or city you are in, and that is the administrative, mundane, and sometimes legalese of cohabitation. It is one of those breaches around which the life of a building is structured, a source of tiny tensions, of micro-conflicts, illusions, implications, skirmishes. It is one of the sometimes bitter controversies which rock the co-owners association meetings, such as the argument over Madame Rule's flower pot, or David Marcia's motorcycle, did he or did he not have the right to park it in the lean-to adjoining the dustbin area? Today, the answer is no longer important, but in the attempts to find it, a good half-dozen legal experts were called in for completely wasted fees. For completely wasted fees. That part made me laugh. Build up to that part is very good, too, in, in the... where the concierge will and will not deliver mail and why. And it has its roots in a class-based system um, that is at this point outdated, but yet still followed by the concierge, and it is tremendous. Next we have the 51st chapter, the Lean Servants Quarter 9. So this is our ninth peek into the Servants' Quarters. Page 259 to 264. Do not be worried, I am not going to read all of that. But I must highlight, this entire section begins with Valene painting himself. And as the painter goes about painting himself, and I'll give you a, a little snippet here from 258, he would be in the painting himself in his bedroom, almost at the top on the right, like an attentive little spider weaving his shimmering web, standing beside his painting with his palette in his hand, with his long gray smock all stained with paint and his violet scarf. I hope you're getting this vision of how Valene is seeing himself paint himself. Well, this goes into a lined writer writing himself. And in this case, I believe, obviously, Perek himself. It is 179 lines. Each one, I mean, it's written out sort of like a deposition would be. And it's a long procession of his characters with their stories, their past, their legends. And so I believe we start off with the lean wanting to paint himself. And then we finish this chapter in this section with the writer, Perek, writing himself. And although he does not say that, and Perek himself in no way is postmodern and involved in this work as of yet. I film as I read, so maybe he will show up and be 
in the boiler room for all I know. But he is not as of yet in there. It still struck me as the writer writing and I think there's wonderful little snippets here. Mark Twain reading his obituary long before he had intended to. <laughs> a student in a long coat staring at a map of the Paris Metro. I'm bouncing around so these are not in order. The aged gentleman's gentleman recomputing his nth factorial. The star seeking admission by meditating a recipe for afters. And then we end with Lonely Valine putting every bit of the block onto his canvas. Every bit of the block onto his canvas. And what do we have here? But Lonely Perec putting every bit of the block literally and figuratively, but literally this block, this apartment block, onto his canvas. Life, a user's manual. Last tonight we have Sinak. Sinak 1, our first introduction, chapter 60, page 327. Sinak is a man who has such an interesting job and what he does in retirement that we must discuss it. Snock is a word killer, a murderer of words. As new words enter the dictionary, his job in an administrative role is to remove those that no longer need to be there. That way we can squeeze the new, more relevant, more modern words in. And it's a funny job when you think of it, and of course it is a real job when you consider it, and you consider how words, especially those of items or recipes, dishes, sayings, jargon, how these things wisp in and wisp out of our culture and consciousness. And Sarek's job is to decide what will ultimately die. However, in retirement, he decides copy down these rare words and to make a dictionary of dead words. He decided to compile a great dictionary of forgotten words, not in order to perpetuate the memory of the Akka, a black-skinned pygmy people of Central Africa, or of Jean Giraud, a historical painter, or of Henry Romagnesi, a composer of romances, 1781-1851, nor to prolong the life of the Skulkerbot, a tetramerous Colopter of the Longicorn family, Ceramibicid branch, but so as to rescue simple words, with simple words which still appealed to him. In ten years he gathered more than eight thousand of them, which contain, obscurely, the trace of a story it has now become almost impossible to hand on. It's a language all his own. 8,000 simple words he just wanted to hold on to. Spadil, the ace of spades in the game of Humber. Ursuline, a small Feminine. ladder leading to a narrow platform. Part four. For real this time. In part four, the contours, if not the puzzle itself, start to take shape. And what we find with Life, a User's Manual is a celebration of stories. It acknowledges that the objects, tenants, visitors, past tenants, workers, the magazines, the books, the television shows, the films that are all contained in one physical space of this apartment block are teeming with stories. So many stories that you can go off on story tangents 
for hours and hours, pages and pages, days and days, and that you could still, if you lived a thousand lifetimes, never get each story told. The puzzle and, and, and the big idea that Bartlebooth comes to, that Winkler helps with, that ties together our narrative is an idea of completion. And in a moment, we'll talk about the success or failure of that. But let's start with two delightful stories. Part four is a ton of fun to read. There's two stories in particular. I've made some notes. So instead of reading from the book this time, I'm going to write down my two notes, or I'm going to read my two notes that I've written down based on these two stories. Both of them from David Marxia. The first from Marxia 6, chapter 75, where we learn how the professional motorcyclist squandered a fortune in three years. And it's an entire arc beginning to end a wonderful story with a fabulous cast of characters and entirely self-contained. Speaking of self-contained, Marcia 5, chapter 73, two chapters earlier. A wholly contained story, almost a novella, and it actually has a title and a full uh, font treatment titled The Tale of the Saddler, His Sister, and Her Mate. And these are the bullet points of this story. A record-setting cyclist turned pacemaker for an even greater cyclist who gifts the great cyclist the marriage of his own sister after his guilt upon disfiguring him with reckless pacemaking born of jealousy, which arrangement lasts only 18 months due to the great cyclist's newfound ugliness dismemberment who then the great cyclist returns many years later to claim his former bride, the sister of the pacemaker, as they are now in love, and he has acquired great wealth and his old wonderful looks due to experimental surgeries in America with his impenetrable, lucrative position in organized crime. Those two stories on their own, you could sink your teeth into and they are just two sections two parts two chapters of part four so part four as in the whole work is celebrating the stories let's go to Bartleby 2 chapter 70 pages 376 to 377 we're going to switch gears and we're going to get back to the meat of Bartleworth, Winkler, the writer, Perec, and the reader. Each of Winkler's puzzles was a new, unique, and irreplaceable adventure for Bartlebooth. When he broke the seal, and spread out on his tablecloth the 750 little pieces of wood that his watercolor had become, it seemed to him that all the experience he had accumulated over five or ten or fifteen years would be of no use. But this time, like every other time, he would have to deal with difficulties he could not even begin to guess at. Each time he vowed to proceed methodically and with discipline, not to rush in headlong, not to try to recover straight away in his fragmented watercolor some detail or other which he thought he could still remember properly, this time he was not going to let his passion or his dreams or his impatience get the better of him. From 377. The main problem was to stay neutral, objective, and above all, flexible. That is to say, free of preconceptions. 
But that was exactly where Gaspard Winkler laid his traps. And it is here that I answer a question from earlier. Who is Bartlebooth and who is Winkler? Winkler is, despite the fact that he is taking an original work of art from Bartlebooth, Winkler, I believe, is the writer. He is the one setting the traps. He is the one creating the puzzle for then Bartlebooth to reconstruct the travels of his life in his later years. As a reader, I want to be in conversation with the writers, with the books that I read. I want the books to be puzzles. I want the works to be fragments for me to try to uncover, to figure out. I want there to be no map or guide and for me sort of lost in the wilderness to uncover something that an author or a writer is trying to say, something hidden. These are the works that I seek out. And it's futile. It, it, it always leads to a quest of trying to extract meaning even when there is none and forcing yourself and your own preconceptions onto the puzzle. But that's the fun of it. That's the fun of discovery, of exploration, of reading. That leads me to this. Bartlebooth 3, chapter 8, page 442. Regarding his plan, which we discussed earlier, it's hard to say whether the plan was feasible or to know if it could have been completed without crumbling beneath the weight of its internal contradictions or falling to pieces as its constituent elements wore out. So we learn whether the plan succeeded or failed. So why? If we set ourselves up with a laborious, meaningless task that is going to take many, many, countless years, and that task is destined to fail, why? Because life, brief, painful, often lonely life, is worth living. And one day, well after we're gone, our lives might make a decent story. And that's how I read part four. All done. Okay. I'm filming from the cellar, part five. Rorschach, that, that awful producer who has no creative bone in his body. He has gone roundabout. He has tried to sell out our great Bartle booth by, by alerting the world for his own creative purposes of, of, the, of, this, of this masterpiece idea that, that Bartle booth has, that he wants to uh, uh, let everyone know about these, these puzzles because now that we know that they're being destroyed, they're valuable pieces of art. Uh, uh, the, the rarity gives them their value. And so we must, of course, halt the proceeding so that we can extract the value for ourselves instead of letting an old man come to peace with his final project. Thankfully, the amortization rates for the merger of the two hotel chains 
turned out to be off by a period of six months, funding dried up, and Rorschach's plan failed. That all happens. That's, those are things. Last bit about part five. Quickly, page 510. Madam Trevins has been doing her own little project, quietly writing something for years and years, and the characters, her fictional characters, are stand-ins for the actual inhabitants that we're learning about. So this is sort of a parallel work to Perec. Within the work, I read to you the way it can go for another artist. Madame Trevins took many years to write this story in the infrequent moments of respite that Madame Moreau allowed her. She took particular pains over her choice of pseudonym, a first name very faintly suggestive of something cultural and a double-barreled surname composed of a first part as banal and ordinary as Jones and a second part alluding to a famous fictitional character. That did not suffice to convince publishers who didn't want anything to do with the first novel written by an 85-year-old spinster. In fact, Madame Trevines was only 82, but that didn't cut much ice with the publishers, and in the end, Madame Trevines lost heart and had a single copy printed, which she dedicated to herself. Bastard. <laughs>